All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we resolved some uh, technical issues. If you haven't heard uh, our usual uh, Master of Ceremonies for these sessions, Richard um, is missing this morning. We hope he's all right, but uh, we had to set up a new Zoom link because I did not have the login. Um, in any event, we're glad that you found your way here. Hopefully others will continue to trickle in. Uh, but this is our um, extra session to wrap up our seminar series on Tim Eastman's book, Untying the Gordian Knot, Process, Reality, and Context. Uh, today, Tim uh, will give a few remarks to start, and then he's asked uh, myself and uh, Michael Epperson uh, to offer some uh, summary remarks um, highlighting uh, aspects of the book that we found important, and, and uh, then we will, as usual, open it up for dialogue with everyone present. All right, sound good. Uh, Tim, I think I need to allow you to unmute. Okay. Yes, I'm on mute. I think I'm all okay now. And uh, so to speak as a reminder, my uh, integrative effort with on tying the Gordian knot had its origins uh, some 30 plus years ago, as I indicate in page one with the experience I had back uh, along the uh, Big Stone Lake in a rural area of Western Minnesota where I grew up. Uh, and I used that, so to speak, in combination with a, some comments on meaning and the end of chapter eight as a bookend, uh, sort of linking those, uh, you know, the spiritual experience early on, and then, so to speak, struggling with all these issues over the years and finally coming back to a, uh, a, a, a new understanding about, well, how, could one possibly base reference to meaning in some uh, as as a real uh, aspect of the of, of the world? So um, I, I have some reflections on untying the Gordian knot, which is uh, which which is a handout that's part of this, along with a set of references, about a page of selected references that don't themselves, and most of them don't show up in untying because. They all it came mostly came after the publication of the book in December 2020. Uh, so ch check out that list, and uh, you might find uh, something. Uh, you know, it, all of them are uh, worth a look. I, I assure you. Anyway, um, so uh, what I have attempted to do is uh, with. Uh, with the Antine Gordian knot is built on recent developments in logic, philosophy, semiotics, and quantum physics, among other fields, to in, in, in a new approach to affirming the reality of real possibility, both ontological and epistemic. And I've done this in part by apostatizing two fundamental metaphysical order, both that of the Boolean order of actualization and a non-Boolean order of possible relations or potential. Uh, and by in this way, uh, treating these as fundamental uh, metaphysical orders uh, prior and like pre-space, uh, prior to, so to speak, reference to something like the, uh, the uh, space-time description or uh, metric description as used in relativity theory, uh, it becomes then possible to newly conceive of how basic physical relations or quote laws could arise as constraints on potential, as well as providing a new understanding of how such laws applying, apply uniformly across the universe, which is the principle of universality, for which uh, these are notions for which, uh, so far as I know, there's no other known uh, explanation. Indeed, the Logi framework appears to function not just as one philosophical framework among others, but as a meta-philosophy that is in some ways capable of being a generator of philosophical and scientific hypotheses. For example, there are lists of Ontine's potential contributions on uh, pages 233 to 257 and hypotheses for the Gordian knot of, on, of problems as, uh, on pages 66 to 81. Um, so I offer the frame, this framework, which builds directly on the uh, relational realism of Michael Epperson and Elias Zafiris, and we have with us today Mike, Dr. Epperson to give comment. And the possibilism of Ruth Kashner, who uh, has commented in a previous session, 
and who has uh, another uh, approach to interpreting quantum physics, both of these without changing the basic framework or the physics of quantum theory, but providing complementary interpretive, uh, complementary frameworks of understanding. Uh, and I think they're, from what I know, I think they're potentially equivalent, but that hasn't, that's yet, yet to be determined just to, in what way are the frameworks of Mike Epperson and Ruth Kastner is effectively equivalent. Uh, but I think on a pre-space level, in some way they are. And that these represent efforts that complement many excellent recent integrative works, Ken Wilbur's and various others. And, but Anton Gordinat is my own particular uh, unique contribution to an ongoing renaissance of integrated philosophical efforts, along with a strong heritage of process relational philosophy, including Whitehead and among others, the Logoi framework points to substantial synergy between system theory, semiotics, biosemiotics, and process relational philosophy. I think one synergy that has been not cultivated that needs to be, and that is between the worldwide uh, intellectual and, uh, well, scholarly efforts in semiotics and biosemiotics with process philosophy. I think there's very much uh, that could be taken advantage of there that is, is not yet uh, fully utilized. So in part, uh, the Logoi framework, uh, one of the advantages I think is that it considers triadicity as primal for any and all physical relations. Thus for any dyad, there's always some associated triadic relation, whether directly or indirectly, there's always some embedded context and or history from fundamental quantum process to, process to the most intricate of complex systems. Complementary to the, this emphasis on the fundamentality of semiotic non-dyadic ontology, and the importance of possibilist hypotheses and their concomitant generalized logic. There's also, as fleshed out by Professor Randy Oxier, a very insightful essay on Royce's philosophy. Uh, and by the way, uh, Randy, Randy Oxier has been part of this dialogue series as well. And he concludes with a strong critique of non-possibilist realism that, quote, hypothesizes external relation, or also like nominalism, until it threatens the reality of a world of truth and a single universal world time, undermining what Whitehead would call the, the quote, togetherness of the world. From these perspectives, self-conscious awareness and its subjective feeling arise from nonlinear feedback between, say, the reflexive contrast of that which is and that which could be, an act of selection, quantum process potential to actualizations and channeling of these processes through the neurological system and mental models that is mapping in the spirit of uh, Robert Rosen's work on complex systems, enabling various le varying levels of anticipatory capability. Uh, I may note that brain actualizations or brain states represent Boolean outputs or affected system measurements which is often simply the reductive focus on st standard neurological neuroscience research, which is important for those such questions, but such research approaches when focused solely on the order of actualizations and the correlations cannot by themselves in principle, quote, solve, unquote, the consciousness issue due to the neglect of landscapes of potential. Rather, the mind can be thought of as a real emergent complex system that manages inputs, both the order of actualizations and the order of potential, given both environmental context and interoception and working via complex systems modeling of enfolding inputs and unfolding responses makes and implements decisions. Neuropsychiatrist Daniel Siegel provides useful detail about the relation of an expanded mind concept arising from information energy flows along with emergent consciousness within that, in addition to an emphasis on tra the transition from possibility to actuality. Such transition can be modulated not only during states of normal consciousness, but also in practices of focused meditation, uh, meditative practice, as described in Siegel's book, Mind, in 2017. A similar complexity applies to creativity and its underlying mental processes. From a logoi framework perspective, creativity would correlate with enhanced tapping of the order of potential. So, uh, in the last session, chapter eight, and then in several other places, I build on the work of uh, an important work of philosopher James Bradley. And this is in, indicated in his collective essays, which came out in 2021 that I recommend for everyone for whom, quote, meaning is enabled through multiple levels of context and through the interrelated combination of his, of his three basic questions, the nature of origin, difference, and order. These questions and their answers correspond closely 
or origin to the concepts of potentia, the non-contingent and ultimates, for difference, succession, quantum process, and actualization in a diachronic manner, along with extension and multi-level emergence, that is a synchronic aspect, and for quote order, multi-level constraints on potentia, enabling Persian generals or physical relation, that is laws, along with meaning from the above argument for an intrinsic ground for meaning based on input, output, context, triads at multi-level, finally to ultimate context, there could then possibly be a basis for reference to ethics in some real way in the world. Once again, within the Logoi framework, the counterpart for creative possibility and meaning as realities in the world is the pre-space-time fundamental order of non-Boolean potentia, which contrasts with the fundamental order of Boolean actualizations. Besides indications of this understanding via possible interpretations of quantum physics, one might ask, could there be some additional route to testability in a broad sense? And I might note briefly that uh, indeed, I think there may be a route to testability that is based upon a recent book by Christopher Botch, uh, LSD in the Mind of the Universe. Uh, he describes a se sequence of experiments using LSD very carefully controlled over some period of uh, 20 years. And uh, my hypothesis would be that if you had a control experiment involving 20 to 30 people over a time frame of maybe 15, 20 years doing this, that the qualitative uh, integrated result of that would potentially uh, uh, provide strong test of the hypothesis of say cosmic consciousness and tapping into some kind of non-Boolean order as a part of reality, reality fully understood as being both the actual and the possible. With that, I'll turn back over to Matt. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, interesting hypothesis there, or a, a rather proposed experiment that we can talk about uh, during the dialogue session, uh, portion of this session. I want to now uh, introduce Michael Epperson. Um, Dr. Epperson has been with us uh, to speak on a few more, a few occasions uh, prior to this. Um, he is the founding director of the Center for Philosophy in the Natural Sciences in the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics at uh, California State University in Sacramento, uh, where he's a research professor and principal investigator. He's the author of a couple of really uh, fantastic books. Uh, one, Quantum Mechanics and the Philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead, and another co-authored with uh, Elias Zephyrus, Foundations of Relational Realism, a topological approach to quantum mechanics and the philosophy of nature. As you heard uh, from Tim, uh, Dr. Epperson's work, or Michael, if I may, uh, was very important for helping to frame uh, the, the Lo Logoi framework. Uh, and so, uh, Michael, I hand it over to you. I think you've already unmuted, great. Let me get you spotlighted and then the floor is yours. Well, that's intimidating, spotlighted. I don't know what that <laughs> means, but it sounds all right. But uh, so a couple of things before, are we, because we started a little late, are we in a compressed time frame? Are we still ending at 10 or are we going to go We're going to go a half hour over. So consider a normal time frame. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then the other thing is, well, now I'm spotlighted. I can't see everybody. Because Zoom is, I'm sure we're all sick of it, but I just want to say hi to the people that I know. I haven't seen forever, John and and Gary and Tim and Carolyn and people I don't know also, I'd like to say hi and um, hope everybody's staying safe and healthy out there. And hopefully we'll be back in person meeting and having these kinds of things in person because I I just hate Zoom. I'm sorry, yeah. it's just the worst. <laughs> I'm looking at a camera because you know, you got to look at the camera in order for it to come across right. But then it's weird because it's like you're talking to yourself. So I'm going to be talking to my feeling like I'm talking to myself for the next few minutes. but. Uh, anyway, hi, everybody. Uh, and I just wanted to say, Tim and I talked on the phone um, uh, a couple of days ago because I asked him, well, what, what would you like me to, you know, to talk about at this meeting? Because there's so much to talk about. And he came up with an interesting, uh, an interesting idea. And that is that um, what I do at, at Cal State is I, I do a, a history and philosophy of science courses. So what that essentially involves is, is going all the way back to the beginnings of the history of science, which in the, at least in the West, we'd say begins with the Milesians, you know, in the, in the sixth century BC. And, um, and the, the idea of it is that 
it's not just an intellectual exercise. The idea is that if you look at the evolution of conceptual frameworks, the conceptual frameworks that are fundamental um, to, to, to conventional science, you look at how these things evolved over time, what you end up finding is that there are concepts that are, that are, that, 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 uh, that are central along the way, but they don't get abandoned. It's not as though we discover that the concepts really aren't that great and then we improve them as though the goal is to find the, the, you know, the fundamental answers to the questions that we're asking scientifically. It's more like, and you know, this is the essence of Kuhn, of course, it's more like what we're trying to do is not figure out or refine a fundamental answer. We're trying to refine the questions. And if you refine the questions as you go, then the concepts that you come up with end up becoming rehabilitated you know, as, as we go. We don't ever really throw away old ideas. We just reincorporate them and refine them um, into our new ideas in science. That just is what, you know, through the lens of intellectual history, if you look at the evolution of science, that's what you see. The other thing you see is that these divorces, these dualisms that, that are the academics talk about a lot, like science versus philosophy. A lot of physicists like Lawrence Krauss leaps to mind, but there was others too, that say, well, science is separate from philosophy and philosophy is terrible because all you do is spin your wheels and philosophy of science is the worst, you know, because they intrude on our fundamental uh, uh, questions and our fundamental answers. And, but really, if you look at it historically, and a lot of us already know this, but the word science as we use it today is basic, it's natural philosophy. That, that's, that's the enterprise. There's nothing different about, the, the main difference between modern natural philosophy, aka science, and ancient natural philosophy, because they didn't, the Greeks didn't, they had the word science, but they didn't use it the same way we use it today. The main difference is that ancient natural philosophy is observational natural philosophy. Modern natural philosophy is empirical natural philosophy. There's a method that was invented in the 17th century that refines natural philosophy. So that's as we recognize today in science. But in the ancient period, they didn't have the empirical method. They had uh, essentially observations. And, um, and by the time we get to Aristotle, it's logical observational natural philosophy. And um, logic is just as important today as it, as it was back then, Aristotelian logic. So really the enterprise is the same, natural philosophy and, and, and modern science, especially something like fundamental uh, physics. The goal ultimately is to refine the questions, to ask better and better questions. And along the way, um, again, going back to the Hellenic period, one of the big innovations that I don't see talked about very much, but it's very important in works like Tim's and the stuff I try to do, um, is this idea of an abstract, it's very Whiteheadian idea as well, the, the significance of an abstract conceptual object. A conceptual object is not just an epistemic construction of the mind that we use to grasp physical reality, which is the ultimate reality but rather an abstract conceptual object is as real as a concrete physical object. So there's this duality between con concrete physical and abstract conceptual. And that's an interesting innovation. And it begins in the Hellenic period. Um, you know, the, if you're, I don't wanna get into, you know, do a lecture on Milesian natural philosophy, but essentially it was very reductive. The goal was to reduce the four fundamental elements, earth, air, fire, water to just one. Um, and um, the Anaximander, who was one of these Milesians, introduced this idea of an abstract conceptual object. To my thinking, it's the first time such an object was introduced in, in this framework. And that is that there's this generic substance, this, which you cannot perceive directly, but it's, 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 it's reasonable to assume there was really no formal logic then. So, but logically, probably he would have said, um, it makes sense that there would be this abstract object, which he called apuron, it has no form, it's boundless, but it's real, it's a substance. And then Anaximenes, the, the, the third of the Milesians, he, he introduces, this I think is the most important thing for me about the Milesians, he introduces the concept of a force, an abstract, physically significant, but it's an abstract conceptual object of a force, not just a substance, but forces that act on the substances. For him, it was uh, rarefaction and condensation, these opposing forces. This is a really important innovation because you don't ever perceive forces directly. You perceive them based on what they do to physical concrete objects that you can perceive. And he introduces this, this idea of a force 
We see it in Empedocles later on in the fifth century with love and strife, attraction and repulsion, the forces are usually in opposition. And of course, you know, we see this in modern electromagnetism as well. But this is a great innovation because you get a lot of mileage out of it. And the Pythagoreans around the same time, obviously they went crazy with the idea because there's nothing more abstract and conceptual as an object than math, mathematical objects, numbers. And they basically said, yeah, it's all, reality is fundamentally reducible to abstract conceptual objects with numbers. And um, you see that reflected in some modern physics today. If you look at uh, physicists like Max Tegmark, uh, with his old, uh, mathematical universe hypothesis. He's basically like a modern Pythagorean. Let's reduce everything in experience to just numbers. But I guess the point is we see this, this idea of an abstract conceptual object as something that we grasp with the mind in the same way that we grasp physical, concrete physical objects with our senses, but we don't construct them. They're not merely constructs of the mind. They're not just tools or representations of what's ultimately real, concrete, physical. But these things are objectively real in their own way. Um, and this is, this, this is so uh, crucial to modern physics that we even forget that that's what we're doing. Uh, so the, the role of measurement context in Tim's framework and in the kind of framework that, that I'm working on, um, this is essentially the move. We're saying that contextuality it's not just to be assimilated to subjectivity. Therefore, it's just a function of, you know, the particulars of the subjective uh, agent doing the subjective measurement. There's nothing fundamentally objective or real about it. No, measurement context in quantum mechanics is objective. It's objectively, uh, uh, its contributions to measurement are objectively measurable. The contributions themselves are measurable. And so there's something objective about contextuality. Not to say that we're reducing contextuality to something that's physical, but there's something meaningful about it in an objective sense. Um, that's, that's new, you know, that, that, that's a new way of looking at quantum mechanics. When, by new, I mean, you know, it's been emphasized really since the 1990s and the early 2000s where we start really focusing on this this feature of quantum measurement, that measurement context is super important. Ruth uh, talks about it. Oh, she has a great paper that just came out a couple of months ago. I think it was in Foundations of Physics where she talks about the importance of non-unitary um, evolution in, in quantum measurement, which is essentially the, when context kicks in, when measurement context kicks in and potential outcome states, which are very vague and hazy, become refined as probable outcome states. That's that 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 phase of measurement was typically just kind of ignored. It's just, well, it's not really that important, you know, this von Neumann's process one. But now it's not ignored as much as it used to be because it's it's it, it it's crucial to quantum measurement. And there's no way, no explanation. There's no way to reduce it to some other feature of quantum mechanics. It's its own thing, contextuality. Likewise, just more generally, um, we 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 use the word, you know, uh, wave function. Oh, the wave function. The way it does this, it does that. People who do philosophy of science are always referring to the wave function. And um, we forget, I think sometimes, because I've read phrases like, well, the wave function propagates through the apparatus. So that by the time it gets from point A to point B, it's, it's changed. And so it evolves in time, you know. It's referred to as some kind of physical, concrete, mechanical wave, because that's the classical model paradigm by which we envision something like a, a, a mathematical wave. But the wave function is not a physical object in the form of a mathematical function. It's not a physical mechanical wave that takes the form of a mathematical function. I think that's how a lot of people think of it. The wave function is a mathematical function in the form of a mechanical wave. So the mechanical wave part of it, it's, it's not fundamental to it. It's just, it's a handy way of trying to relate all of the mathematical ideas that are inside this thing. And in fact, you don't need a wave function. You could use a density matrix, you know, there's a Heisenberg's matrix mechanics formulation, which I prefer because it doesn't inspire you to make that mistake because there's a, a density matrix is purely conceptual. I mean, there's no, you just look at it. There's nothing physical about it. So you don't make that mistake of assimilating it to something concrete and physical. So it's all over quantum mechanics, these abstract conceptual objects as being fundamental and they're physically significant. So these things have physical significance. Obviously fields and field theory um, play that role. 
a lot of people think of a field, I'm just talking classical field theory. Oh, it's, it's fundamentally reducible to physical, what, particles zooming around? I don't know, you watch Star Trek, you became a big Star Trek fan, you got the force field and you assume, well, there must be little electrons or some kind of particle zipping around that the, you, know, you collide with and it makes the, no. This was the beauty of Maxwell, who basically made it pretty clear that a field is a mathematical structure. It's a mathematical structure fundamentally, and it has physical effects. So we never measure it directly. We measure its effects on physical things, but we always assume it's there. It doesn't just magically appear when there's physical things to be affected by fields. The fields are there. So we see it all throughout. And this is the genius of Whitehead, because he obviously knew all of this. And so what we have in, for me, Whiteheadian a natural philosophy is this attempt to show that really what's, what's, what's most important is not reduction. We want universality in, like in, in, in the way that Tim uses the term, but you don't need necessarily reduction if you have universality. Universality does not presuppose reduction to just one thing, in this case, physical, mechanical things. Um, you could have universa universality where the fundamental um, object of that framework is relations. So we redefine relations not as just, um, you know, uh, uh, I was about to use the word, it's relations, I'm gonna use it twice. Relations are not just relations between physical objects that we, that are qualitative and then we quantify them, but rather relations um, can hold between physical objects or between conceptual objects or hybrids of both. And relations are the objects. We treat relations objectively. That's the move. So we don't just say it's physical, it's mechanical, therefore it's an object of modern physics. Modern physics has got way more conceptual objects in it than it does physical objects, if you ask me. So we have to redefine what's objective about science and what's objective is, is relations. Relations are the objects. And then we can relate relations. And we could use the mathematical formalism, which only captures parts of the relations. We don't reduce these relations to math. I mean, we don't, I don't, you can if you want. Um, but the mathematics can be very handy because we can then say, you know, it's not some, about simple deterministic cause and effect, but in quantum mechanics, we see relations as affecting probability functions, probability distributions, conditionalizing probabilities. Um, that's meaningful. Uh, and because when you conditionalize a probable outcome, you leave room for something other than just a, a, a reproduction of what the states were before in a deterministic way, because it's a probability function. Now you have the possibility for novelty and creativity. And, but it's not a free-for-all because there's an objective conditioning of the creativity and the novelty by virtue of the relations between that particular relation and the rest of the universe, because again, the desideratum is universality. So I like Tim's framework because it emphasizes, look, physics is universal, that's, that's, the, that's the goal, but it can be universal without being reductive. And we can essentially be more explicit about our presuppositions by saying, we're using conceptual objects in modern physics in the same way that we use physical objects. And we shouldn't, we should just stop with the whole dualism and stop attempting to reduce one to the other and stop attempting to reduce conceptual to physical. But figure out a framework that uses both. And it's not all hand wavy, you know, which is what a lot of people criticize philosophers of science as doing, because you can objectively um, and empirically demonstrate the function of conceptual objects in these relations. Again, it started with Maxwell but it, it's certainly important in quantum mechanics, obviously. And um, so it's not hand wavy, it's very precise. It's just a matter of sort of a, hoping that the paradigm shifts a little bit to, to, to redefine conceptual objects and relations in this, in this way. And to me, that's the important thing about Tim's book because it shows the promise. If you, like, if you would just make that move, then you can see how you could extend some of these ideas more broadly and non-reductively. And um, I think things are tending, trending in that direction. It just, it's just, it's difficult to do philosophy of science in this, in this climate because it's usually dismissed uh, uh, by both sides. Philosophers don't like it. I know from experience 
because they don't really, well, who knows? They think you're trying to reduce velocity to physics or something. And physicists generally don't like it either because they look at it as an intrusion. So it's a kind of a boutique kind of cottage industry. And um, so it's rough, it's rough going, but it's worth it because um, it just, you know, in time, I think, and looking at the way quantum mechanics has been interpreted over the years, it's trending towards um, this, this, this viewpoint, it seems to me. It's trending towards this paradigm shift. It's just gonna take a long time. It's very gradual, but if you look at just the changes from the 1990s when decoherence, not to get into the weeds of it, but, but you know, decoherence is another conceptual function um, in quantum mechanics. It was dismissed in the 90s. It's just, well, that's just a math trick. And now it's not at all. I mean, it's, it's viewed as a fundamental physical process. Um, purely mathematical and conceptual as a process, but that's it's fundamental to measurement. So in just a you know a couple of decades, we've seen a move in, in in that direction. I think it's going to keep going in that direction, especially with uh, this with books like like Tim's and other people who are trying to contribute in that direction. So that's all I have to say. I don't I don't know how long I've been talking, but it seems like it's a good place to stop. So there you go. So congratulations again, Tim. It's an awesome awesome book. I love it, and I'm going to use it in my class. Thanks very much, Michael. That was wonderful. Um, I've got a couple of questions written down for later um, for you. So let me remove your spotlight and uh, shift over to uh, gallery view for myself. So <clears throat> let's see, I need to spotlight myself now. Thanks, everyone. I'm having to do double duty here. So thanks for your patience. Uh, all right, there we go. So I have prepared a few uh, thoughts. Um, I, I am not in a position to um, to contribute in the sense of um, advancing the Logoi framework in the realms of uh, quantum theory and in, in the ways that I think uh, Michael uh, is. Uh, and so I'm attempting instead to summarize and offer some connections to the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead uh, where I feel more at home. So those of you who have read Science and the Modern World, Whitehead's uh, 1925 book, his first uh, after arriving at Harvard to begin teaching philosophy, will know that uh, he warned uh, that following the quantum and rel relativistic revolutions in physics, uh, that scientific progress had reached a turning point, that, that the old foundations of scientific thought were becoming unintelligible, and he asks, what is the sense of talking about a mechanical explanation when you do not know what you mean by mechanics? And he adds that if science is not to degenerate into a medley of ad hoc hypotheses, then it must become philosophical by entering upon a thorough criticism of its own foundations. So right after Whitehead makes this warning, uh, there was a sort of rise of... Uh, um, a positivist uh, prohibition on speculative metaphysics, which handicapped progress, I would say, into the foundations of post-classical science, and ended up producing precisely the fragmented medley that he feared. Fortunately, a growing chorus of interdisciplinary scientists is taking up the philosophical work that's, uh, that was left unfinished by the early 20th century founders of quantum theory, who were way less reluctant to engage in these philosophical questions. Uh, and of course, uh, Tim in Untying the Gordian Knot uh, has not only um, shown his acumen as a physicist, but in, engaged in some high-level philosophy to add his voice to this ensemble, uh, offering his Logoi framework as a, uh, a meta-theory that aims not only to make ontological sense of quantum physics, but to integrate uh, quantum theory with several other emerging 21st century frameworks, including complex system science, biosemiotics, and category theory. Uh, this, this alone would make uh, Tim's book worthy of careful study, but he goes even further, uh, sketching the plan for a bridge between science, or what he calls the way of numbers, and the human ethical and spiritual spheres, uh, which he calls the way of context, we could say, uh, relative context for human ethics and culture and ultimate context uh, for the spiritual sphere.
but uh, despite the grand scope of his inquiry, Tim remains humble and conciliatory. He says the logo framework is not post anything, but a proto worldview that's seeking to balance both theory and story, both systematic rigor and open-ended adventure. Uh, so Tim's masterful synthesis of dozens of cutting edge uh, researchers across numerous disciplines is impossible to fully summarize uh, in the, these brief remarks, but uh, in what follows, I wanna offer just a few of the important contributions uh, to the birth of a process relational science. So as Tim mentioned, he's, he decided to study physics and philosophy, uh, not only because he wanted to understand the physical world, but uh, because from a young age, he intuited that this wondrous whole that we find ourselves within contained layers of meaning deeper than the merely measurable. Natural science has allowed human beings to reach beyond the mundane proportions of their sense organs and species specific umwelt toward extreme magnitudes in space and time. For example, telescopes extend our eyesight across vast distances of intergalactic space. We're waiting for the James Webb Space Telescope to come online, which will even further extend uh, our vision. Microscopes uh, peer into the nuclei of cells and even atoms. Um, inferences from radioactive decay rates of certain isotopes allow us to infer the age of fossils millions or billions of years into the past. Such techniques have dramatically expanded our, uh, our understanding of the universe and our place within it. But in extending our senses to scales they were not evolved to perceive, often while using empirical concepts that are derived from human scale perception, we run the risk of succumbing to the sort of model-centric literalism that imagines we possess an outside God's eye view of an already finished universe. Tim, uh, in his book, is seeking to re-embed the scientific perspective within the evolving universe that gave rise to it, such that, uh, as he puts it, the most fundamental notions of natural science can be inferred from normal human experience. And this follows from um, Tim's commitment to the Whiteheadian ideal that, uh, as uh, Gary Hurstein and, and Randall Oxier put it in their book, The Quantum of Explanation, concrete existence explains the abstract aspects of experience and not vice versa. Uh, so Tim, in his book, uh, carefully deconstructs the conceptual impediments to philosophical integration of post-classical science, um, such as actualism, nominalism, uh, and determinism, arguing that uh, potentials or potentiae, which a term uh, is a term that I, I believe uh, Tim borrows from Ruth Kastner, uh, Stuart Kaufman, and Michael Epperson in their 2018 paper. Could be wrong. Uh, not sure where the term originated exactly, but uh, potentiae have a creative role to play that both upsets notions of efficient causal closure and reintroduces formal causes into our accounts of natural processes. While quantum physics has forced the issue, Eastman points out, uh, that it is misleading to construe even the formalisms of classical Newtonian physics as though they entailed strict determinism, since all such modeling frameworks make assumptions about initial and boundary conditions, relevant scales, and domains for meaningful solution. Granting uh, potentiae real participation in the physical world not only allows science to consider the anticipatory capacities and creative agency of biological organisms, including that of scientists themselves in a non-reductive way, it also resolves long-standing quantum puzzles, which resulted from trying to force fit a classical mechanistic ontology to results that should indicate the need for a new process relational ontology. Building on the uh, relational reality model of uh, Michael Epperson and Elias Sefirius, Eastman, uh, Tim, describes the evolution of quantum events from pure potential to probabilities to actualization when measured, a process uh, which he describes that involves both logical conditioning and causal reiteration. Tim further argues that acts of measurement are not passive observations of, of already existing facts, but rather themselves establish new facts. There can be no ultimate causal closure either for finite systems or for the universe as a whole, 
since the ontological unrest of newly emerging facts breaks any such closure. And here, uh, Tim suggests a corollary for finite physical systems to Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorems in logic. The universe thus becomes a cumulative succession of what Whitehead called actual occasions, wherein potentiae grow together with actualities by linking local causal interactions with global logical constraints in the ongoing process of realization. This process, as we've heard uh, from Tim and from Mike, includes both a standard Boolean dyadic logic of actualizations, or what we could call res extense, uh, and a triadic logic of potentialities, res potentiae. Uh, Tim argues that, I quote, dyadic relations do not, in fact, exist in the real world, only in the world of abstract modeling. This is because context is inevitably involved and because the relationship between potentiality and actuality is inherently asymmetrical, uh, from whence comes the arrow of time. Uh, Tim's Logoi framework thus carries forward Whitehead's crucial distinction in process and reality between the logical order of concrete events, or what he calls genetic division, and the causal order of metrical space-time, or coordinate division. The former is rooted in quantum process and is given primacy, while the latter, rather than being conceived of as a pre-existing continuum serving as a container for processes, is secondarily emergent from such processes. Uh, grasping the significance of uh, Tim's Logoi framework may be aided by contrasting it with popular actualist accounts uh, Tim critiques the physical uh, theory of everything articulated by Sean Carroll in his book, The Big Picture, uh, where Carroll takes up a sort of God's eye perspective, offering a single, what he calls core theory, which is an equation uh, combining quantum mechanics, space-time, gravity, matter, the Higgs field, and other forces, uh, which Carroll claims, um, when combined, leave no room for any new aspects of the universe that are not already well understood. Um, and Tim points out that while the components of this core equation indeed represent great achievements in practice, no one has ever succeeded in combi combining them into a practical model or simulation. Sean Carroll's core theory thus amounts to no more than a mashup uh, and is not anywhere close to being a working equation. Now, to Carroll's credit, he's one of the relatively few physicists who's willing to engage deeply with uh, philosophers and philosophy and philosophy of science. And so that's really um, wonderful. Uh, he has a popular podcast called Mindscape. He's constantly inviting philosophers on to engage in discussion and dialogue. But he seems, I think, uh, wedded to certain metaphysical presuppositions, which he doesn't recognize as such, or which he thinks that somehow um, physics has uh, uh, at least provided um, uh, weighty evidence in support of uh, that, um, you know, Mike and, and Tim are both trying to challenge here. So <clears throat> moving ahead a little bit to save some time, Whitehead's cosmology, along with Charles Saunders Peirce uh, and contemporary physicist Lee Smolin, um, all of them are often interpreted as implying that um, physical law is more a matter of empirical probability rather than being metaphysically grounded. Um, and since deism is no longer a live option for scientists, as it was in Descartes and Newton's day, uh, very few practicing physicists have attempted to ground law metaphysically. Tim suggests that the closest thing contemporary physics has to such a metaphysical ground for physical laws are uh, so-called symmetry principles. Uh, but uh, from Tim's perspective, these principles remain, uh, remain groundlessly circular descriptions unless they are accompanied by a process relational or some adequate ontology. Now, Peirce attempted to reformulate laws as habits, uh, but uh, in untying the Gordian knot, Tim worries uh, that this may be a category error that despite Peirce's realist intentions falls prey to a kind of nominalism. Uh, for Tim, genuine habits can only be said to emerge at the biological level, as, as I understand him. So without wanting to affirm deductivism, 
uh, or determinism, he nonetheless thinks that um, necessity must have some purchase in nature for the findings of modern physics to make any sense. He thus argues that uh, nature's laws derive not from any deductive necessity, but rather from uh, the conditional contingency of trajectory optimizing histories, uh, for example, uh, the principle of least action. He compares these to uh, Leibniz's striving possibles, and this issue of the status of law um, and the, when habit can be said to emerge in nature, whether only at the biological or perhaps earlier, is a, is a question I'd love to return to during our dialogue. Um, let's see what, okay, so let me skip ahead here. So although Eastman, uh, Tim, creatively expands upon Whitehead's process philosophy, he does so without remaining unduly tied to the latter's categorical scheme. He emphasizes Lehman McHenry's interpretation of Whiteheadian prehensions as concrete functions rather than abstract relations, thus contrasting Whitehead's third approach to his former collaborator Bertrand Russell's nominalistic logical atomism. Now this term prehension, um, Tim follows uh, Charles Hartshorn in uh, seeing this, this, this concept of prehension that Whitehead develops as an important symbolic bridge um, for helping uh, bring together the knower and the known, particularly uh, when it has to do with understanding emergence in nature. And um, Eastman agrees with Hartshorn's sense that prehension is perhaps the most powerful metaphysical generalization ever accomplished, right? As it allows all sorts of relations, um, whether those involving memory, perception, causality, uh, subject object or God world relations uh, to be accounted for in terms of one generic type. Now, prehension uh, is defined by uh, Lehman McHenry in its physical mode as the present occasions absorption of past actual occasions in its process of self-creation from uh, McHenry's 2017 book. This leaves out the role though of conceptual prehension in Whitehead's scheme, that is uh, the present occasions ingression of potentials or eternal objects in its process of self-creation. Um, McHenry, who Tim is, is drawing on here, appears to question the need for Whitehead's eternal objects, at least if they are given a platonic emphasis. Um, Tim claims that his account of diachronic process in terms of pre-space potentia plays a role similar to that of Whitehead's prehensive unification, a concept Whitehead introduces in science and the modern world. Um, and uh, despite approving of Whitehead's perspectival account of the relation between universals and particulars, as an aspect of his uh, concept of eternal objects, uh, Tim seems sometimes to indicate a desire to distance himself from Whitehead's eternal objects, thus implying that there may be important differences between his landscapes of potentia and the realm of eternal objects. And I think this is a, a fertile area for further philosophical exploration. It's come up in prior sessions, uh, particularly in dialogue with um, Randy Oxier, but um, maybe this is another thing we can return to during the dialogue. Um, I would offer briefly right now that um, one way of beginning to explore um, this question stems from um, asking whether the choice of realism over nominalism as regards the status of form in nature, uh, whether it entails Platonism. And Eastman thinks it does not, uh, but Given that Plato wrote dialogues and not doctrines, it all depends what we mean by Platonism. Uh, regardless of the nature of uh, Tim's divergence from Whitehead's category of eternal objects, um, Tim and Whitehead clearly share, as does Peirce, a rejection of nominalism. Uh, Tim puts forward an argument against nominalist actualism that is rooted in quantum potentiae that integrate lo local global interactions without themselves having any specific space-time location, right? They are generals in Peirce's sense, as Tim mentioned earlier, serving as logical constraints on physical processes. So from Tim's point of view, admitting potentiae back into nature uh, is far more parsimonious 
than the actualist, nominalist interpretations of quantum theory uh, that lead to, for example, the many worlds uh, and multiverse hypotheses. Um, at the end of his book, Tim concludes trying to link human and cosmic logoi in search of some sense of the deeper meaning of our existence. While he's careful to avoid any monological fixations, uh, he builds on uh, the work of a physicist, George Ellis, uh, who developed a kenotic morality, wherein human values like truth, goodness, and beauty, uh, in Ellis's terms, reflect the forces or intentions that created the universe as part of the deep structure of the cosmos. Uh, Tim also amplifies Robert Neville's concern about, uh, as Neville puts it, the enormous damage to human civilization resulting from the loss of value reference and realistic valuation uh, in the context of modern uh, materialistic science. Um, with characteristic caution and modesty, uh, Tim seeks to contrast his own Logoi framework, uh, which aims at um, evidence-based methodology. Uh, he aims to contrast it with advocacy-based thinking, even though there are um, implications for our worldview, for, for ethics. Uh, he's nonetheless trying to develop an evidence-based methodology, um, leaving the advocacy, which is not um, inappropriate when it's done in the cultural and political spheres, but leaving that to um, uh, philosophers, perhaps, and really trying to advance our scientific understanding and allowing, uh, though he's not afraid to draw connections, um, that would lead to a shift in worldview, right? He's not really starting his argument on that basis, right? Uh, and then, of course, in the final pages, uh, Eastman honors the Dakota peoples upon whose land he first had the spiritual experience that initiated his inquiry into the nature of reality. I want to share his words there, and then I'll bring this uh, to a close. Tim says, from page 274, in confronting the psychological challenges of nihilism, denialism, and assorted despairs, uh oh, you may have just lost my camera. Sorry about that. I'm back. <clears throat> Sorry. In confronting the psychological challenges of nihilism, denialism, and assorted despairs of contemporary life, in facing up to the physical threats of war, pandemics, human suffering, and in newly realizing the deteriorating Earth's climate, ecology, and habitability, can we somehow embrace what we have learned through science and philosophy, and what we may yet draw from, uh, draw on from indigenous and other spiritualities, so as to bring into being a world in which we humans can live and flourish over the long term? And I think uh, Tim has succeeded in making a major contribution toward just such an integral embrace. So those are my uh, remarks. Uh, at this point, I would uh, invite Tim to chime in in response to anything Michael and I have shared, and then we can open it up to the rest of the participants. Well, uh, thank you, Matt and Michael. Uh, excellent comments, and also thanks to both of you for your role in, well, enabling this uh, dialogue series and uh, also to uh, um, Mike and Elias and to Ruth Kastner for making possible that those precursors that enabled the very possibility of the uh, in, in, integration I have attempted and to uh, John Cobb and David Griffin and other representatives of the of, of process relational framework that uh, who've been John especially has been a mentor to me for the last 30 plus years, and all of this would absolutely be not possible with, uh, and, and also what I've done here is just, so to speak, a, a small increment with respect to, you know, trying to bring together some new developments in the past 20, 30 years that could uh, in some way help push the uh, uh, process relational uh, strategy forward a little bit. Uh, to, to uh, suggest new uh, approaches for uh, good, effective scholarship, and, and to remind people that there are some dead ends. Uh, there are many rabbit holes. And, and, I, 
and 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 we all need to be cautious about uh, rabbit holes. I mean, I uh, the, the rabbit hole of actualism, uh, the rabbit hole of simplistic determinism, uh, uh, mechanistic thinking, uh, and I was there. I as a as a early uh, trained physicist. Uh, 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 steeped in uh, classical mechanics and the usual kinds of interpretation, uh, uh, that was part of my thinking for some time, and it took me a while to then, you know, rethink those things. And then when uh, I read uh, uh, Mike's work and realized that by virtue of looking at a new in a new way at fundamental logic of the distinction of from uh, algebraic quantum theory of uh, as as brought up also in the uh, the the uh, uh, right now I'm a blank on another work that complements Mike's uh, emphasizing the distinction at the most fundamental logic level of a Boolean logic and a non-Boolean logic a logic of the actual and logic of the possible of the possible uh, to recognize that distinction being important to quantum physics when I first realized that uh, some ten years ago it was like a high experience like wow. Uh, then, then I could see a whole new avenue towards making the argument about why a process relational approach, a white eddy approach, and these various avenues, the so to speak, the logoid framework, gradually became coming, came together, and that's what I was trying to uh, articulate in in the book. And it was a great struggle, and uh, there's a lot of missing pieces. And I encourage all of you. Or, uh, tapping, you know, coming into this uh, uh, to encourage others to pick it up to take to the next stage. Uh, uh, I think I, uh, I, I think it's uh, it's not it's not my role to take it to the next stage. I think I'm I'm not like a whitehead. I can't read and write multiple books. I think this is this is kind of it in terms of what. I, but I'll I'll certainly try to work with others too. But but I want to just. It's like pass it on. It's uh, it's it's for others to take take to the next stage, uh, and and uh, but it's it was exciting to, you know, I, many times I had this right in the middle of the night, uh, multiple times I'd wake up with some realization about something, and then I bring Car Carol and coffee in the morning as I do every morning, <laughs> and then we're sharing coffee. I said, hey, guess guess what happened at three a.m. and so then we, can, and then I tell her about this new way of understanding the combination of causation and emergence that, like, came out of the blue, and uh, that was just one among. Uh, it just it was the last ten years have been by far the most creative period of my life, uh, and and I and here it's just a, a, a labor of love. I've really enjoyed it, and I pass it on to others, uh, and. Uh, uh, and, and I think everyone is a real scholar has that experience, that, that creative moment. And I'm just very lucky to have had several cases of that as part of this effort. Uh, and thank you very much for your, all, all of you for your participation and, and uh, encourage you all to identify a portion here as something to take forward. Uh, there, there are all kinds of loose ends in what I have done. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. It's quite uh, an achievement, and uh, we're grateful to you for putting in those many uh, long nights of, of effort to get this written, waking up in the middle of the night when those insights come. Uh, and um, But yes, as you say, it's a proto-worldview, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm eager to continue to, to try to carry this work forward in whatever ways I can, and I know I'm not alone. Um, oh, yeah. oh, by the way, with respect to the term proto-worldview, I caught... I picked that up uh, from the great scholar who's with us, Mikhail Epstein. Uh, I believe he signed on. And so thank you so much for that contribution and for uh, your insightful comments on humanities and, uh, and, and new approaches of understanding. Uh, thank you so much to Do uh, Professor Epstein. Perhaps right. he wishes to make a comment. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would be glad to make some comments uh, if you please. Allow me, yeah. Some personal view on uh, Tim's book. Um, as a Russianist and uh, as a person who worked in uh, cultural studies, philology, philosophy, uh, I felt a kind of isolation in my <laughs> intellectual pursuit. And when I published uh, 20 some years ago a book, um, A Philosophy of the Possible, Modalities in Thought and Culture, uh, 
uh, I uh, um, felt myself to be isolated in the uh, world of possibilist thought because my uh, thesis uh, um, against the prevailing uh, approaches uh, to the possible, and there were different approaches, nominalistic, realistic, conceptualistic. My uh, approach was uh, not uh, nominalistic or realistic approach to the possible, but possibilistic approach to language, to reality, to thinking. And uh, uh, this is what I uh, find so compelling and uh, kindred spirit, kindred mind in uh, Tim's uh, um, logo uh, framework uh, uh, that uh, uh, possibility, potential is uh, uh, not uh, just, uh, uh, um, how to say, uh, the object, the theme, uh, the talk to elaborate on, but the criterion, the uh, mode of perception of all realities, both uh, humanistic and physical and uh, biological and semiotic, uh, uh, looking through the um, prism of uh, possibilism and uh, potentiation. Uh, 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 Tim uses the term potential, and this is term probably number one in uh, his uh, uh, worldview. Uh, uh, but uh, um, I believe that uh, it's also about potentiation as a process. That means that not only act actualization of potential happens uh, through physical world, uh, but it is also potentiation of actualities of the physical world, which happens through our consciousness. Uh, um, and uh, uh, is, of course, uh, uh, the field of the humanities and philosophy and metaphysics, which enormously potentialize the world of actualities. That means uh, offers uh, multiple uh, wave-like, so to say, interpretations of uh, reality and therefore uh, in a kind of circuit way communicates with those potential that uh, precede actualization. So uh, for me, it is like uh, all embracing uh, uh, process of uh, physical actualization of potential and then spiritual, intellectual, potentiation of actualities, coming to, uh, again, uh, to the world of potential, but now spiritual potential. And, uh, for, uh, um, and I find, uh, uh, though I was a little bit uh, familiar with uh, Whitehead uh, before, but uh, of course, uh, these discussions uh, in uh, the circle of uh, <laughs> seasoned uh, uh, Whitehe uh, Whiteheadians uh, 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 are very important for me uh, because uh, this is where uh, I feel uh, the future of philosophy is, not with analytical tradition, which is very boring, exhausting, very uh, flat, uh, and uh, doesn't help us to uh, understand that uh, uh, philosophy as uh, a way of potentiation of the world uh, is uh, the future of technology, the future of science, actually it is uh, the most uh, transformative idea that uh, can be uh, suggested to unify both technology, science, the humanities, uh, um, cultural futurologism and linguistic futurologism. Uh, so I believe that uh, this uh, book, uh, uh, Tim's book, uh, Logo Framework, uh, can serve as a uh, really a point of consensus among various disciplines uh, on the basis of uh, potential and potentiation uh, to uh, join our uh, multidisciplinary uh, efforts uh, in uh, offer to offer uh, the appropriate philosophical platform for the theory of everything. Uh, uh, because theory of everything cannot be just physical theory or biological theory or any single disciplinary uh, theory. It should be, of course, uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, and um, for that, I am very grateful to Tim and to uh, all uh, colleagues. Uh, this was uh, really for me a moment of, uh, how to say, to coming from a closet, uh, disciplinary, <laughs> disciplinary uh, closet uh, of uh, uh, my uh, past uh, possibilism, lonely possibilism. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, uh, very good comments. And I might note that uh, Dr. Epstein also has a book on possibility, uh, I believe, translated from the Russian. It's quite relatively recent. I encourage you, uh, those here, to, to check that out. Uh, uh, and uh, I noted that uh, 
Thomas Royce has brought up a question in the chat, uh, most interesting question about, you know, this uh, relative to the dominance of the of actualism and uh, deterministic presumption among uh, scientists and so forth. Uh, to what extent might I think that the, the the acceptance of something like logo framework, a new a new integrated framework, uh, could be yet possible, and and I think this relates to a discussion I had with Mike Epperson this past week, and that is, uh, up through the mid nineteenth century, it was so to speak presumed that we had to do scholarship uh, of a scientific sort with the interaction, the interrelationship of the logic, the philosophy, the mathematics, and the uh, and the science, uh, so to speak, integral natural philosophy. In fact, I have a, a book called Natural Philosophy, uh, dated 1870, which uh, I, I sent off to Mike Epperson. So he has <laughs> it has a good good concrete example of that in his hand. Uh, and uh, and yet, in the past century, with the great advances of mathematical physics and of the rather reductive science, uh, uh, it's become almost commonplace to simply presume that that the standard language, uh, the, 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 the rigorous language is always somehow science itself or science based and, and that sort of his you know, new standard of rigor. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I, I agree with the notions that we should be as rigorous as we can in the context. Uh, but the, the difficulty is that, uh, that they, that, that we now understand from the recent uh, discussions and efforts in understanding quantum physics that the philosophic aspect is is essential and key to understanding quantum physics. That's also true for relativity theory. So I think the actual fact of uh, contemporary philosophy of physics is an example of why one needs to attend to not just the mathematics and the physics, but you have to do the mathematics, the physics, and the philosophy and logic. You have to do them as an integral piece, so to speak, as a new natural philosophy. That's what Mike suggested to me. What we need is a new natural philosophy uh, in which you don't neglect that. And if you do, if you just assume you can reduce it to nothing but, say, uh, propositions that are context independent in a reductive scientific mode, that in actualism, uh, that is, um, that's, that's, that's scientism. That's not science in a broader sense. And I think the new science, the new natural philosophy needs to be combining all of these, the, the logic, the philosophy, the mathematics, the physics, uh, the science and the philosophy in a more integral way and to not somehow pretend that subsets of that in one's model, uh, all such models being temporary routes to providing solutions for specific focus problems, but to make broad inclusive claims and to then not reference the role of context and not reference the role of the history, not reference the philosophic dimension, to me is uh, uh, simplistic reductionism, it's scientism, uh, that's not the best of science, that's not the most rigorous of science. We need to advance scholarship in a way that is truly inclusive, in a way that's pointed to by uh, Dr. Epstein and, uh, and and the other scholars that are all part of this discussion. Uh, so I think eventually I'm hoping that uh, you know, the best of science and philosophers will come around and recognize the need for such a integrative approach uh, and, and get away from uh, the kind of reductionism, which I think has actually been counterproductive, if, if not actually undermining their own agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, for addressing that great question uh, from Thomas. Um, Thomas, unless you have any follow up, uh, I see Kent had a question, but Thomas, did you want to add anything? Uh, Thomas, <laughs> If, if I were to add anything, it would be in uh, relation to the discussion about Zoom. Um, I happen to think that it's one of the greatest things that's happened to me in, in my life, simply because prior to Z the, these type of, uh, what would you say, gatherings, I had no option or no uh, ability to interact with 
uh, people of the stature that I had, I see in this group. And so I have to say as a rank amateur and all of these things, I <clears throat> feel a bit like a punk kid who's managed to sneak into a <laughs> jam session amongst a bunch of rock stars. <laughs> and even though I'm uh, constantly reminded when I'm here about just how thick-headed I can be, I seem to learn something every time that I'm here. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, and uh, I hope things of this nature can continue. Thank you, oh. Thomas. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Thomas. And I might note, Thomas, uh, that you uh, are, are too modest uh, in the sense that uh, all good science, good scholarship really is articulating good question. And you articulated a really good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can, can I, can I I'm sorry, can, can I just jump in really please, fast please. to say, I didn't, I, I didn't mean to sound like a baby about the Zoom <laughs> because it's just having to teach with Zoom for two years. It's, that is really what I was trying to, convey that it's it, it's a wonder you're right uh, Thomas it's, I'm grateful for it for because it's easy to participate in conversations you wouldn't be able to do otherwise it's just I fear that a lot of times at least in academia as soon as a new tool comes along that that's useful in certain circumstances it's almost like there's a drive to reduce to reduce all of uh, you know pedagogical theory to that tool and that's kind of what's been happening in, in college these days because we all had to learn it. And now that everyone's learned it, now everyone wants to use it all the time. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> it, scares, it, scares, it scares me a little bit. Yeah. That's all I was well, trying to say. You know? well, well, another feature is that a lot, sometimes people think that everything's online so that you just put Google search and you can get whatever you need and everything is available. Well, that's not true. Uh, my, my wife, Carolyn, was administrator <laughs> at the Library of Congress for many years, just right. you know, retired in 2014 mm -hmm. after leading the Kluge Center of Scholars. And she knows firsthand that uh, of the resources at the Library of Congress, like more than 95% are not available online. They're not digitized. So we have a long way to go to <laughs> have a fully digitized memory of human uh, documentation. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think, Michael, you might be thinking of uh, having to lecture to students, most of whom will turn off their videos. And so you're just talking into the board. And, uh, I don't enjoy that either. <laughs> but this is a more lively group. <laughs> um, well, Jude Jones, maybe you have something to offer or share with us, given your experience with the education and teaching at Fordham. Let's go to Jude in just a sec, if, if we can, because I, I wanted to acknowledge Kent's question, and then you'll, you'll be next, Jude. Go ahead, Kent. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Tim, and everyone else for this series. This has been uh, really quite amazing to be able to, to listen to all these uh, sessions, and I've got a lot out of them. I guess my question is around like what next um, in terms of this larger issue. What I see, it, what I would characterize is like this real focus of substance metaphysics, and what is going to kind of be the catalyst and to move into more of a process relational metaphysics and if it, you feel like quantum ontology is the real highly leveraged point where the work of Everson, Zafiris, and Kastner, if that's, if, and, and Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well in terms of if you see that as like a real highly leveraged point. Uh, for me, I see the work of like say David Chalmers has a new book called Reality Plus, which uh, my day job, I do a VR podcast. So I had a chance to do an interview with him. And I feel like there's some interesting things he's talking about in terms of simulation theory and how that's potentially recasting some of these different metaphysical assumptions that we have. But uh, in particular, the experiential aspect, I think, is another leverage point that I see, at least, in terms of the he Chalmers is arguing that we shouldn't be contrasting the virtual reality with real reality, that we should be contrasting it with physical reality versus the virtual reality. So there's a interesting thing that's happening from an experiential perspective of trying to make these differentiations from an experiential perspective that the virtual reality is a genuine reality is what Chalmers arguing. But I feel that there is, uh, I asked, I had a chance to ask him about what he thought about uh, like uh, process relational metaphysics, but he hasn't really dug into Whitehead so much, but I feel like there's the core of the argument of saying that there's aspects of the virtual 
uh, reality that is just as real that starts to move towards a more of a process relational ontology. And I had actually a chance to interview Matt for my podcast as well, kind of digging into that. But I'd love to hear just some general thoughts of what you see as like potential leverage points in the larger cultural landscape of ideas when it comes to moving away from this kind of real reductive materialism, physicalism, and substance metaphysics into more of a process relational metaphysics. Can I jump in just quick to answer? Please. Because I love the question. I love that. I'm consumed with that question all the time. And um, I would say, just again, based on the history of science and the history of scientific progress, you're going to see a real move once there is some sort of tangible technological application of this new uh, paradigm. And what you see it, we haven't really seen it in quantum measurement until fairly recently with this new it's very exciting aspect of quantum measurement these days has to do with a phenomenon called a topological phase shifts. And basically in a nutshell, without getting into the weeds, topological, or usually they're called geometric phases, but really they're topological. They've been known and acknowledged for a long time. And they've been acknowledged as kind of a hic hiccup. It would be, a, Kuhn would call it an anomaly, not really a critical anomaly, but it's like, well, that's interesting. Oh, but it's fundamentally meaningless because you can just kind of ignore uh, the, 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 the manifestation of this interesting thing, this phase shift. But now we're, we're, we're discovering that no, what, what the idea is by making a local measurement where you can measure this phase shift, you get global information about the state of the system from a local measurement. The easiest analogy would be like a Foucault's pendulum, you know, in a museum by measuring this, and there's a phase, but it shifts because it rotates. And by looking at that shift, which is a local measurement, you get some information about something going on globally beyond the context of that individual measurement. And the reason that's interesting technologically is it allows for the possibility of probing a system non-locally and getting information about a system in a way that you could never do classically. So I think something like that is gonna really kickstart the shift away from the mechanical paradigm because there's no mechanical classical mechanical explanation for something like that. Um, also keep an eye on uh, uh, Microsoft's quantum computing team because I've, I'm, I'm not a fan of quantum computing, at least in terms of the way it's been oversimplified as to what it can actually do. But they're using this notion of topological phases in order to sort of, that's their focus. I think they're the only team really focusing on it. And they've made some very interesting progress with it. And it's very white heading, by the way. <clears throat> I think you'll see that as, as, as that develops, people are gonna be looking for a conceptual framework that can accommodate some of these interesting, spooky action at a distance type phenomena. So I think something like that is really gonna kickstart the move into a, a better metaphysics. And then your second point, which, which I thought was a, um, um, a really, really interesting question about simulation theory, essentially. I'm so tired of hearing about simulation theory. I'm so tired of this argument about VR. I think VR is great. Will it be a replacement for R? I think, again, quantum mechanics gives us a hint in the sense that it's an exemplification of the metaphysics. There's an interesting thing about quantum mechanics and that is that you cannot embed the global state into a global Boolean algebra. Now, a computer, any kind of digital uh, framework has to be able to do that, right? You have, to, so imagine uh, you have a book full of word problems in algebra it has to be the case that there is a global algebra that is uh, that, that all of the different word problems on every page of the book can be embedded within and that it's consistent. But quantum mechanics gives us, it gives us a proof that there is no such global Boolean algebra in which you can embed physical reality at the global scale. This has been proven mathematically by uh, Simon Koken and the koken specker theorem, but it's also just a fact of quantum measurement. And so that to me is the key. It, it, it demonstrates that there is no way to just assimilate the global to the local or the local to the global. And you would have to be able to do that with you know, the metaverse or with the, you know, a, a, a perfect simulation. And that would look qualitatively different than our world. In other words, if there is a global Boolean algebra in which you can embed this idea of a global state, a global state vector in quantum mechanics, um, the world would look very different than this world, the real world, not useless. It's not like, oh, it wouldn't be fun. I love video games and I love you know, the fact that even though I know I'm playing a video game and I know everything is globally Boolean in the game, it's still fun. And it might be useful like Zoom is useful for meetings like this. 
but as to some sort of idea that reality can be reduced to uh, a, a simulate the idea of a simulation is just science fiction and it annoys me when I hear people talking too much about it and spending a lot of money investigating it when just simple understanding, uh, not a simple understanding, but at least a somewhat deeper understanding of things like quantum mechanics and natural philosophy more broadly in the 21st century, um, you, you, you would dispense with questions like that and focus your efforts on something else, you know, and not try to overextend um, this very interesting thing, virtual reality, overextended into something like some kind of fundamental question about reality. That that I find annoying. It's an, I, it's understandable, but we need to be better, I think, about um, acknowledging the conceptual foundations of our scientific theories, so that you don't don't talk fast and loose about things like quantum mechanics, the wave function example I gave, or things like VR or simulation theory, and certainly not investing billions of dollars like uh, you know like. Like Zuckerberg thinks there's some big promise there. That that to me is frustrating when there's so many other problems in the world we should be probably focusing our mental energies on. But that's just me venting, like I was doing with Zoom, so I apologize. <laughs> but the, I hope that, that that's my my view of of of, uh, of an answer to your two questions. Yeah, that's that's great, Michael. Um, I just shared in the chat that it, it's there's a long history of uh, mistaking the latest technological innovations for uh, ontology or hypostatizing uh, a, a technology, whether it's the clock or the steam engine or the computer or you know VR, um, th these new technologies give us interesting analogies, you know, to ask interesting questions about the nature of nature. But uh, this rush to identify um, the brain with a computer or you know etc. I think is uh, kind of lazy thinking. Um, but there's another aspect of Kent's question that I wanted to address, which is, um, and this relates to what Thomas was asking as well. To my surprise, um, panpsychism is beginning to uh, catch on among analytic philosophers, philosophers of mind. Philip Goff is the biggest name here, but there are others. And I've had a chance to dialogue with, with Goff. Uh, he's the author of uh, a book called Galileo's Error, if you're familiar. If you're not familiar, um, but in his own way, he's kind of critiquing the bifurcation of nature in that book. Um, but in talking to Goff, um, I was asking why he uh, builds his approach to panpsychism on a sort of throwaway comment by Bertrand Russell about uh, physics only telling us about the structure of matter and nothing about its intrinsic nature. And Russell suggests, well, maybe its intrinsic nature is consciousness or experience. And that's the basis for Goff's uh, whole project. And I, you know, I asked, well, why didn't you choose Whitehead instead? He has a rather uh, more elaborate, you know, metaphysical scheme that uh, works out how, you know, maybe not panpsychism, but panexperientialism um, could be applied across various domains from physics to human experience. And he didn't have a good answer. He said he didn't quite understand it. And I asked him about, you know, it seems to me that his panpsychism is a very much a substance property form of panpsychism. And I've come to realize that the process relational approach to let's, you know, call it pan experientialism following Griffin's, uh, David Griffin's suggestion, it's as different from substance property panpsychism as it is from materialism, right? And so this shift to a process ontology is really crucial. And even if panpsychism does become more popular in the form that, that Goff is articulating it, we're still stuck in actualism. We're still stuck in sub substance ontology. And so it's not actually addressing some of the quantum puzzles that a process ontology could address. Um, and so I'm starting to be more disappointed, even though I was initially excited by the, the, the rise of panpsychism. It's moving in the wrong direction, I think. So. Look to hear if there's any any other thoughts that Tim may have in terms of next steps, or if he this larger discussion around substance metaphysics and process relational metaphysics. Um, well, I uh, well I think uh, the whole field of philosophy of physics and interpretation of quantum physics is a very important subgroup of uh, scholars within. Of, of the physics and philosophy, at least that's a group that really explicitly acknowledges the importance of the combination of, of the science and the philosophy. 
Uh, and, and that bridge, I think, is so important to lots of areas, including like, say, uh, philosophy of biology and so forth. So, I, But it's important to all areas of science and scientific interpretation, as I would argue with the understanding of rethinking in terms of a new natural philosophy, as uh, Mike Epperson uh, encourages. So yes, I think uh, if, as inroads and as possible uh, developments of uh, I, I think it could be very influential if a few lead scientists, say physicists, really took on uh, this. Uh, I think the, the, the philosophy of physics area is, is an example uh, where it's beginning to make a real impact. But then again, the difficulty is that some, such as uh, Gerhard de Hooft, are so committed to determinism and actualism uh, that they can't see outside of the box, in my view, uh, even, the, even though they're exceedingly skilled in other respects. Yeah, thanks for the question, Kent. Um, I see Gary's hand up, but I wanted to make sure that Jude had a chance because uh, Tim called on you earlier. Did you want to chime in, Jude? Sure. Um, eventually, I'm going to ask Tim to clarify you know, the question about education. But uh, you know, things have evolved since then. It's interesting, so many years ago, right after Conscious Mind came out, I, I don't know how I even wound up invited to it, but I was at a conference, small conference on Chalmers' book and uh, Chalmers' work. And I implored him to read Whitehead after you know, my paper, which you know, linked what he was doing with Whiteheadian concepts. And he was basically you know, begging for a shortcut because you know, it takes commitment to, to read and absorb you know, process metaphysics alongside everything else. Um, so, you know, he's had that recommendation out there for a long time and that doesn't sound like he's done it yet. But um, it's interesting because I, I was just, um, Kent, I, I actually had my students read an interview with Chalmers on the v, um, Reality Plus book. Um, it was on a podcast uh, or a taped interview with Vox magazine um, where he was talking about this and, and um, the question of, of, you know, where virtual reality stands in relation to reality. And, and part of what, and this will lead back to the education stuff, you know, part of what he was talking about in the full interview was the fact, not so much of, you know, VR um, coming to be a stand-in or, or an equal, or from what I can tell, I haven't read the book yet, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but that, it it's, it's raises a lot of questions that I think are akin to what we're talking about here, which is that part of what we're doing when we're talking about reality and examining, you know, what are our fundamental constructs that are most useful about it is related to questions of meaning making. Um, you know, that, that people are, and my students among them, willing to entertain the possibility that reality is bigger than our standard concepts, including the reductive materialistic view, when they think of it in terms of the meaningfulness of various structures, experiences, et cetera, in their lives and wanting to recognize those as real, right? Even, you know, so the experience of fiction, of art, of music, as bona fide revelations of modalities of reality, even though they're quite different from the sort of, you know, standard scientific model that they're all sort of brought up breathing and, and, and eating. Um, and, and, and yet Chalmers is also you know, trying to be careful there. And I imagine the book goes into this, that, you know, that we can't conflate the question of reality with the question of meaning, but we can't separate them either. And so the virtual in the meaning space of discussions of reality, you know, has its place as an enhancing, as a legitimate contender for being called a kind of reality, a level of reality, uh, uh, a register of reality. I, I'm, I, I worry about level talk because it hierarchizes, but maybe a register of reality might be a better term. Um, and so, you know, getting back to the education question then, you know, this really excited my students, but also perplexes them because they come in born and bred with a certain kind of, well, of course, the world is just what physics and biology tell us it is. Um, although maybe some students with, you know, abiding, you know, religious convictions or other kinds of practices that suggest that there's more to the story, maybe don't buy into that. But there's, but even them, you know, they think, well, science is true. Science is obviously true. And so how do we 
align all these other things that we'd also like to say are real alongside that you know true description allegedly quote unquote that science gives us and and i think we're at a at a moment i, I experience it anyway in my own teaching that um, it's a point of genuine perplexity, like an existential perplexity, that the pandemic has only exacerbated because it made people turn in on themselves in terms of, you know, really having to examine what's important, what is meaningful, what is the world about, what does the future look like, not just the pandemic, but all the challenges that, that we have in front of us that, you know, John Cobb has been so, you know, incredibly inspiring and in trying to turn our creative energies towards dealing with them, um, you know, they recognize that there are limits to the resources that have been authorized to deal with that, um, but haven't yet been able to intellectually harness it. And I think these kinds of models, you know, Chalmers was an interesting thing. I'm gradually easing them towards the kind of whitehead thing. They haven't read it yet, but, um, you know, uh, it's a moment of perplexity that I think we could make creative use of, but it's also really challenging. You know, how do you enter into a generational mindset that has adopted something not as a dogma but just as obviously true you know um but these 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 challenges right now have created an opportunity to move that a little bit you know because i think there's a recognition that something's missing mm -hmm. um and so I'm, I'm keen to hear what anybody has to say. I don't have any great answers, but I think it's a moment of creative opportunity in the embrace of the possible rather than the actual. Um, so yeah. I think that's enough of a spiel for me. <laughs> well, well th thank you, Jude. Let me, uh, so to speak, come back to something I brought forward in the first chapter of uh, Untying, Untying the Gordian Knot, and that had to do with the uh, fundamental ways of knowing. Uh, and, and I think it, 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 it emphasizes, it helps to emphasize the limitations of science. If we frame that science is fundamentally uh, the, the, the uh, trying to identify propositions that are context independent so that the physical law can be applied on planet Earth uh, or Mars or some extraterrestrial stellar system, uh, or wherever. So it'd be context independent and, and, and we apply models and map those into mathematical forms to try to get at what are the fundamental propositions that are as context independent as we can that then in turn also help to solve physical problems. But there's also sets of propositions that are context emphasized or in you know that for which you emphasize context that also are part of the real of real experience more inclusively has brought out very much in the work of uh, Mikhail Epstein and, and, and all of us. Uh, uh, so, so to me, those are sets of propositions such that to think of the propositions that are context uh, independent, it, that's not all of science, of course. You got boundary conditions and other kind of interpretive discussions that are context dependent. On the other hand, the, the or emphasis is towards Boolean thinking and context independent propositions. So that, that tends to make scientific propositions per se it necessarily limited and constrained uh, and, and, and to claim that they somehow are universal and well, in the sense of being all inclusive, a scientism uh, and actualism to me is misunderstanding them. Uh, and so we need to see it as a distinct way of knowing the emphasis on context independence, but also along with there's a those things that emphasize context dependence, poetry and literature and history. all kinds of history. Uh, so it's so it's so important to incorporate the context in history into one's understanding of things because now we're caught up in a contemporary world with so many people indulging in context denialism, in history denialism and all sorts of denialisms that depend upon this kind of uh, you know, and it becomes even dangerous uh, to be involved with, uh, you know, dialogues that fail to grapple with that complexity of the real world. So, so that's why I think the way of knowing in terms of an emphasis on context independence, science, way, the emphasis on context dependence, humanities and so forth, and pointing to ultimate context, the spiritual dimension. We need all three. 
Yeah, it was an exciting moment yesterday. I, I actually was trying to push a, um, for pedagogical purposes, a, a, an idea that there's no such thing as truly context independent statements. You know, I'm a born and bred Whiteheadian. So, you know, even though science aspires in that direction is not really true. So I was talking to one of my students who came to office hours to talk about, you know, what is phenomenology? And we wound up, you know, getting to a lot of things. And, and I, and he said, well, we were talking about first person experience. And, and he said, and I said, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, phenomenologists want to say that there's no stepping outside of that, which is not a veil between us and reality, but that just is, you know, how we deal with this. And he says, well, what about the third person point of view? And he just thought, well, clearly we can do that. And I said, well, what is that third person point of view, you know, that, that somehow is, you know, context independent. And I could just sort of see his head exploding. <laughs> <laughs> sort of moved into a different frame of reference. Um, so I was very pleased with that moment that I think was a hopeful moment in the direction of what Tim is urging us towards. Yeah, very good, thanks. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, <clears throat> um, Gary, thanks for your patience, go ahead. Well, I wanna thank Tim. Um, I really echo this, I'm an amateur and I am in the presence of a bunch of rock stars. That metaphor was great. But uh, at my own personal cognitive bias level, meaning seems to be a very fundamental issue that we have the work of, say, uh, Roland Griffiths at uh, Johns Hopkins working with psilocybin. The majority of people that go through that experience say they were completely absent their ego, that they had some sense of being in the presence of God and, so, and that it was the most meaningful experience of their life. That's a, and so you have that Jung contribution that psyche is real, that's absent from the, from the materialist perspective. Psyche is real, the direct, and he makes the case that, uh, that the reality of God is personal experience that absent all those truth claims of mainstream religions, the experience of God, we don't want to ignore uh, as a Jungian perspective. So I, it seems to me <clears throat> that what we're, this breakthrough that I think I'm hoping for, and as I think I hear everybody is anticipating some, something's trying to percolate through uh, and this, the role of mind in the universe seems to me to be uh, central. That's my own personal bias. Yeah, yeah. I would say even a couple of years ago, I was pretty skeptical about the notion of cosmic consciousness and that kind of uh, hypothesis. Now I've come to think that uh, it's it's real that that yeah. there is something real about some notion of of uh, an inter interdependence interrelationship that uh, that is a superset of of our exceedingly finite minds. Well, Jung refers to an inner experience of self with a capital S, and that we normally operate in the world on a subject object basis. But if one encounters the self, that relationship is you're the object, you know, that, that there is a subjective consciousness out there that is of which we're objects. And that's a, an experience that one can have in quotes. John, uh, John Cobb, I see you were waving to get yes. our attention. Uh, Thank you. I, I just wanted to make one suggestion about a way in which it, a lot of people might be able to understand the, the limits of science and the importance of history. Uh, science, I think, inherently can only deal with repetitive things. If, if an event is simply occurs, but it's different from every other event, how would you deal with it scientifically? Yeah. You would find features of it that are re repeatable, but no, but the event itself is not. And um, 
history used to play a very large role in higher education and it is fading because of the dominance of scientism. And even when you talk about the past, there's a tendency to be looking for repetitive things. But I think people know their own personal life story includes unique events, dr dramatic unique events. In principle, they cannot be dealt with, but that doesn't make them less important. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, then I wanted also just to, uh, to comment. I'm very proud of the fact that I created this committee um, to advise the set of a pro for, to, well to advise the process movement on science. And I think it's the first time there has been a organization of this kind. And I think Matt, you have your hands on something that is extremely important. And I hope all these folks are going to give you lots of support. And I wish I could give you more. I can just say, I think we are very fortunate to have somebody like Matt to. Oh, thanks, John. <laughs> to bring us together. And, and it's uh, identifying the topics that need to be dealt with is going to be a very crucial role. Hmm. And you can all help him. I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not suggesting, when I say he can be the, he will be our leader. I'm, I'm not saying that means leaders can't, can't lead without a lot of other people. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I do need to do something else now, but I appreciate so, I mean, I, I have a very strong sense that right now we are living, and I think several of you echoed this, we're living at a time when breakthroughs are possible. They're taking place yeah. in all sorts of ways. At the same time, the most powerful movements are trying to prevent the breakthroughs, mm -hmm. and they have very good chance of leading to the suicide of the human race. I think if we give up history, we, because it doesn't, it's not repetitive. Mm -hmm. We that we will uh, there'll, there'll be no meaning to our lives because we won't have any story to live in. Yeah, we, without a story, we are gone. Anyway, thank you very much, and t Tim, you've done a wonderful job for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, John. Yes. Thank you, John. <clears throat> of course, none of us would be here doing this without John's inspiration. Um, but uh, this is this is going to be a uh, a team effort to carry this work forward. I, I agree with with John that there we're in this liminal moment now, where um, a lot of ideas which would have been dismissed are now on the table. Uh, it's sort of a, um, we're in the midst of a civilizational mutation, you know, and it's not clear which of the possible trajectories will be actualized. Uh, and so, but now's the time, uh, you know, for us to, to do this work with, with great passion, uh, in an attempt to influence that future, which is fast approaching. Um, so I think, uh, Farzad, you're next. Why don't you go ahead and chime in? I'm sure you've got something fascinating to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, my head is exploding even more than I thought it would, which uh, is generally a lot. So <laughs> this is really, uh, really amazing and wonderful. Um, all the ground we've gone through today and, and, and the weeks and months before. Uh, wow. So so much here I, at the intersection of all these different thoughts uh it's hard to know where to start so uh, start at the center i guess really is the idea um i mean from the very start when um tim ended his his uh quick presentation with the lsd experiment across you know large-scale generational 
Uh, that kind of blew my mind. Didn't expect to, to see that right off there. But then the growing interest, as you know, Matt, you're involved with that um, Psychedelics and Philosophy Conference series that uh, uh, I'm in with you as well. Uh, so much is happening so fast all around in so many different uh, efforts like that that um, it's, it's fun to bring that into the picture in a real uh, serious way and suddenly there's many things to point to. So the little remark I made earlier about, uh, let's see, uh, Islamic philosophy, uh, Alam al-Mithal, uh, the movie Dune, uh, and, uh, and the uh, LSD experiment, all of that kind of blends together with the whole exploration of possibility. The very last thing you said about we're in a liminal moment of history where which possible trajectory can be taken, that's really what's at the core of the book Dune. <laughs> the experience, that psychedelic type of experience that the protagonist has there is to try to see and you know it's a deterministic picture in Dune, I won't get into the whole plot there, but uh, the author borrows a lot from Islamic culture, uh, Middle Eastern culture and Islamic philosophy and so uh, one one strand of that that's of great interest uh, to me and more and more lately is uh, the Neoplatonic influence in Islamic philosophy which kind of binds itself with the Pythagorean and Platonic influence to become the source of a lot of what is now generally referred to uh, as uh, Islamic occult sciences uh, and some serious work is being done in translating that and discussing it in a way that uh, um, for the last I guess something like 25 or 30 years occult sciences as a topic in Europe European occult sciences is legitimate but the Islamic stuff has not been part of the scene. Interestingly, and I think it has to do with cultural problems of, of really sidelining non-European cultures in general, uh, especially when a lot of the uh, core um, of uh, Hellenistic philosophy comes through the Islamic translation and commentary and development effort and then goes to Europe and then becomes European uh, science, European uh, occult science, regular science, and philosophy. So anyway, uh, quick footnote there uh, to deal with later, much later, but uh, the, the thoughts of, of virtual reality and why that's sticking right now in such an intense way and the simulation argument still there in such an intense way um, and the panpsychism now getting kind of a lot of attraction in the uh, uh, analytic school, all of these are kind of, they're going for the right target and they're doing it in all kinds of ways that are, are you know, to be expected uh, when, you, when you don't have a broad enough and you've already made up your mind about, you know, actualism and, and what's real. But they are authentic responses to something that could be done much better and I think that's what we're talking about here. And that's what Tim has brought to the surface, like, okay, we want to talk about these things, how do we do it in a way that can fasten on to good math, good science, uh, good uh, theoretical basis, uh, really take in the humanities in a serious manner, um, the, the way of words and, and the way of context, and, and, and move forward. And so I, I see that all kind of coming together uh, right here. Um, so I'll make one comment about uh, VR and simulation theory and Islamic philosophy and then that's enough for now because there's just too much exploding at the same time. Um, all right, so VR. The inventor of VR, Jaron Lanier, is uh, amazingly critical, wonderfully critical about uh, artificial intelligence and his invention of VR, which is now like 30 or 40 years old. Uh, and basically he says uh, this thing uh, that if we content ourselves with current technology, as you were saying before, Matt, and try to base our ontology on that, we're doing a really huge disservice to the to the concept um, of VR, to the concept of intelligence at all, and uh, and he maintains that he always has maintained that uh, in every presentation that he makes. Um, what's the good way of doing VR? What's the the authentic way of doing artificial intelligence? In a way, uh, that concept Alam al Mithal, which is part of Dune, he kind of picks up and refers to it nicely 
but then he doesn't elaborate on it, is a major concept in Islamic uh, philosophy, uh, especially in mysticism. And it's that uh, alam means world and mithal means images or likenesses. It's the uh, layer in between the ideas and uh, the, the world of particulars, or the physical world and the ideal world, or conceptual world. Well, I should say ideal world. And it occupies that middle region, and lots of stuff is thrown in there. Uh, lots of philosophical problems are handled by the existence of this basic uh, world of, you might call it, theoretical entities, to be simplistic. Uh, but they, they include it in the ontology as an essential part, and it is the conduit through which um, ideas uh, are potentiated the potentia, the actualities are potentiated, potentiated uh, as uh, Mikhail was saying, through the activity of the intellect with its own concepts here at our level of intelligence, and that hooks up upward into the world of ideas. I, I'm abbre abbreviating it mercilessly, but basically it is that layer in between that mediates and is the channel for uh, that connection between human um, art, philosophy, intellectual effort, etc., and um, the potentia, the, what, the, what the forms might be called. And they elaborate on it in great length and detail. And uh, so you visit that uh, after death, that's uh, the place of uh, after uh, life is finished. It's the place of dreams, uh, prophetic dreams. It's the place of all prophecies. It's the place of intellectual um, exploration, uh, out of body, you might say, uh, which a lot of quantum theory is out of body, right? A lot of out of body thinking occurs in that place. It's given a reality, it's given an ontological status uh, so that it can be harvested and used and then enacted back here. So there's a real up and down motion there. Um, the Holy Spirit, if you will, is uh, ontologized in this manner. Um, and so, that's VR. It's virtual. It's reality, and and so forth, and uh, uh, it's just a really great place for exploration. It's not very familiar as a concept, I know, in in uh, philosophy or philosophical discussions, uh, but it's a huge one in Islamic philosophy, and I think we'll be hearing more and more of this. Um, I, I've been tapping into the uh, the young scholars who are working on both translation and commentary. Of, uh, uh, of, of things Islamic, and it's, it's booming right now. It's in a renaissance as well. So a lot of good literature out there for that. That's all I'll say for now. I really enjoyed everything today. Everything is just mwah, lovely. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Farzad. Yeah, thank you, Farzad. Yeah. Oh, it, it just occurs to me that, you know, your reference to the occult sciences, whether Islamic or European, um, or so-called esoteric science, that a lot of what uh, falls under that category could be reinterpreted as an attempt to uh, peer into this realm of or landscape of potentia. And because modern science has been actualist and materialist, that these other approaches to doing science, which would involve uh, the sort of um, imaginative participation in this middle realm that you're describing have been just dismissed as um, um, you know a holdover from the childish phase of, of human evolution or something but uh, it could be that with this new logoi framework and, and and other frameworks that are possibilist in orientation that we could retrieve some of these esoteric and occult insights put them in a new context and understand better what uh, these uh, ancient practitioners were really attempting to do. Absolutely. I, like, I love that. Yeah, I think so. I see Anderson Weeks has his hand up. Anderson. Go ahead, Anderson. Hi, thank you. This is so exciting. I'm having so much fun. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you said, Matt. You were talking about how panpsychism is growing in popularity, but then at the end of the day, there seems to be something missing and disappointing about it. And I think that's that's a rich topic um, because there's something very interesting going on. Uh, and I think it's good to be explicit about it. There's two kinds of panpsychism out there. Um, and although it is growing in popularity, uh, you're right that it, the analytic philosophers are attracted to the version that they find suggested by Russell. 
and there's a specific reason for that. Um, they they do feel a sort of guilt about the sort of exclusion of mind from nature, the, the marginalization of everything that, that classical uh, physics can't explain. Um, so they, there's a guilt about ignoring that or marginalizing it, evicting it from the universe. Um, so they, they found a way to let it back in without making any concessions to anything. So the kind of mind that Russell is intimating is one that's locked on the inside, cabined in there, sealed off. So, okay, you've got it. There it is. Mind is back in nature, but it's hermetically sealed on the inside. And so you can have it all you want, but it's not going to make any difference to the outside. There's no interaction. There's no, there's no, it's not part of the development of anything on the outside and the outside is only part of the development on the inside. It reminds me exactly, it's exactly what Kant accomplished. How can you have a world that is scientifically knowable, but also a world in which we can have religion and morality and free will and yada, yada, yada. Uh, well, you can't, according to, to Kant, but you could have both those worlds if you could find some strange way to, to juxtapose them in some sort of disjunctive or contrapositive relationship. Each one is the negation of the other. You can have both, but not at the same time. So you can be one or the other. They don't interact. They're separated. Each one neutralizes the other. It's the exact same thing. We'll have, we have the outside of things, that's classical physics. And we can give them an inside too, but they, they'll never interact. They, they, each one is, the, is the, the negation of the other. We'll have them both, but they're in this contrapositive relationship. So a lot of people who are doing panpsychism are doing it in this way that it is not really allowing for any kind of efficacy of mind and nature. It's a way of putting mind in nature. It's locking it away in a neutralized cabined way to guarantee that we, we, we can't get accused of exercising it, right? Uh, of evicting it from the universe, but we, we, we are actually inoculating a classical mechanistic actualistic view of the world of experience from any threat of that which we have now sealed inside as a kind of secret, secret heart. And so we need to be careful. I, if, I, if I understood Jude correctly, I think she suggested correct me if I misunderstood you, that Chalmers wanted you to give him a short intro or a, 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 a quick way into Whitehead. I had, that's what I, what I thought you said. I had the same problem with someone else, I won't name his name, but a, an equally famous person, so uh, who does a lot of panpsychism and stuff, said, well, you know, I just never had time to read Whitehead. And he wanted me to give him some kind of a summary or, you know, what 10 pages could he read? The problem is they know it's not just 10 pages. So we need to find some way to get them on board, make, the, make them uh, loosen up their strictures because they're using panpsychism in a way that does not in fact advance the problem, but uh, sort of uh, cements the problem we have of not explaining how mind is part of nature. Yeah, well said, Anderson. <clears throat> I agree. Any, any, anyone else wanna share some thoughts on what Anderson is, is saying? I, I posted a comment there that there are a couple of books and dozens of articles um, wrestling with the so-called combination problem, which to my mind is a problem which arises precisely because of this hermetically sealed uh, uh, concept of mind that the analytic panpsychists are uh, working with. The combination problem is how do uh, little minds add up to bigger minds? Uh, it's kind of an emergence issue. And William James you know, formulated this uh, over a century ago um, in uh, Principles of Psychology, I believe, um, almost a century and a half ago. And, uh, but I think he also, at least James hints at the solution to the problem that he found also in, in the same passage. And uh, Whitehead's process ontology, of course, uh, provides us a way around the so-called combination problem, uh, which is just a function of not taking relations seriously, I think. So um, yeah, we need to, uh, to uh, butt into these um, debates among the analytic panpsychists and, and just um, hold them down and force them to read some Whitehead, I guess. <laughs> Can I just uh, jump in real, really quick, Please. I promise. Uh, I, um, this is a great conversation and um, I especially like the reference to Neoplatonism when we were talking about, uh, well, this in the early phases of, of, of this topic, but also early on, so I forget who Brett brought up the issue of eternal objects, as being, well, I know Tim, you were talking about it, as being one of the kind of the hiccups in process philosophy. A lot of people don't like it because they, 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 they it feels very platonic and it feels like it's, uh, wouldn't it be nice if Whitehead just 
hadn't mentioned eternal objects at all. But the, the way that connects to this discussion of consciousness, for me anyway, is, is that um, the Neoplatonists solved the problem, or at least, you know, did something with Plato's concept of the archive by making these things essentially the conceptual objects within the mind of God, so that they pre-existed. Uh, you know, there are these forms in a, in a very Platonic sense that sort of that exist in their own reality, and they sort of participate in the world in different ways. Via well, for Plato, it was uh, well, mephesis and mimesis. You know, duplication or participation, but it was all very vague. And um, but for Whitehead, you know, he defines eternal objects in a very particular way at the very beginning where he's going through all the categorical obligations. And he says they're, they're to be understood as, I'm, I'm quoting, I think, I might be messing it up a little bit, pure potentia or pure potentialities for the specific determination of fact. So um, for me, this means that there's a predicative uh, form, a predicative pattern that, that's part of process. And the reason you need an eternal object is because you need to have some generic uh, form. It's not a real potential that's, that's, that's uh, rehabilitated through process. In other words, it's a predicative pattern that already existed back in the history of whatever it is you're talking about, whatever society or just globally, but rather it's a new, it's something to genuinely new. I mean, you don't have novelty without eternal objects, but they're not necessarily the way I read them they're not necessarily you know, pre-established patterns that exist in their own reality, but rather they are the thing that allows genuine novelty to occur. They're the things that allow you to, to assume there will be a predicative pattern in a relation, even a novel predicative pattern. It's sort of like the, the thing that allows novelty is actually the eternal object, which is generally the opposite of the way people treat eternal objects, or at least casually, they assume that means, oh, there's a pre-established pattern that is just comes into, comes into operation at some, at some point. I don't look at eternal objects that way. And in terms of consciousness, you know, I guess there, it, it, it's the idea that there can be this level of reality that is presupposed by this relational structure that we're all interested in, this... Um, this process structure, a world not of information, but a world in formation it perpetually, that for that to work, there has to be the presupposition of some level of um, relation that's beyond. And it, it participates, but it's sort of like a panentheistic way of looking at the theology in a way. It's, it's consciousness is at home in the universe, but it's also the home of the universe, the universe being the, the universe as, as we conventionally mean the term. So it's part of it, but it also exceeds it. And you wouldn't have a universe without it. And to me, I don't know, the panpsychism, sometimes people play fast and loose with the phrase, it means different things to different people. Sometimes to, to me that this gets lost. I, it's, people speak of it reductively sometimes, panpsychism. And that's why I like David's, you know, reformulation of pan-experientialism, because it's, it seems to be a little bit more, um, uh, it, it, it has a, a promise of generalization that panpsychism as a phrase doesn't necessarily have. So I was just trying to tie this back to the discussion of eternal object, but I, that's, that's all I have to say on it. It's just something that I find interesting myself. Yeah, and it's an important contribution, uh, Michael. Thanks. I've, I've had an opportunity to try to make a similar clarification with uh, Terrence Deacon, um, who I, he mentions Whitehead in his book, Incomplete Nature, but has this, I think, um, faulty interpretation of what Whitehead means, as if Whitehead was saying that there's some, that eternal objects limit novelty, which is the exact opposite of his in intention. Um, right. And so there's some confusion there. And so our, we Whitehead interpreters have our work cut out for us on this point. Yeah, Michael, uh, thank you for your uh, friendly amendment to our understanding of Whitehead. Uh, uh, they're very insightful. I like it. Uh, so, like, so to speak, uh, possibilities of, of evolution long term, uh, a archetypal uh, forms of relation, that kind of thing, as opposed to you know, something that's kind of fixed in the standard Platonic framing. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we've, we've reached the end of our extended time uh, together today due to our delay. 
so I don't want to hold you uh, any longer, but um, this is so much fun. I, I, I think we're going to need to find a way to continue the dialogues. Um, there's so many avenues to explore here, so many threads that I'd like to continue weaving uh, with all of you. So stay tuned for that. We have your email addresses and we'll reach out uh, to, uh, to plan the next gathering, um, probably initially on Zoom, but we're also uh, in conversation with the Cobb Institute and the Center for Process Studies uh, about a uh, real live in-person conference uh, at some point in the future. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, thank you to all the contributors, the panelists, and uh, participants. This has been such a wonderful uh, series of seminars. They're all recorded. Uh, the first eight are already on the Cobb Institute website, and this one will be posted soon. So if you've missed any, you can review them. I'll post the chat uh, also there so that you can see all the comments. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, onward. We have work yet to do. <laughs> Thanks to all. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks to all. <laughs>